We'll just make some adjustments, all right? We should be okay. A little different without something to lean on here, but uh, anyway, that way I won't preach that long, you know? Because <laughs> just if I lean on it, see what happens? If I lean on it, it go down. So if we get down too far, we're, we're in trouble. Something I want to share with uh, just for a few moments, uh, I think is so vitally important because, you know, everything in our lessons that we've been learning over the last little while have to do uh, with God's Word. And probably the number one thing that we have learned over the last eight weeks, going on nine weeks now, is the fact that God's Word doesn't change. Yeah. God's Word is foundational to everything we believe. We've learned on why it was preserved so that you and I would have it today. We've talked about the values that the Bible actually shares with us in regards to how we need to establish our lives based on the principles and the values that are taught in Scripture. We've talked about understanding the Word of God and how important it is to understand some basic principles. To start off with the scripture that we've been dealing with, at the beginning of our series of stuff that we've talked about since January was in Psalms 119. I'm going to turn to several scriptures. If you have time, just write them down if you want to. Hopefully that will help you. Most of you have these in your study books, the little green books that you have, and, and for our home groups. And we're going to be starting a new set of home groups uh, in April. Uh, this group, uh, these groups will cease on the 17th. We're going to have an incredible celebration Sunday on uh, March 17th. I know it's St. Patrick's Day. We have green pews just for St. Patrick's Day. But anyway, a little humor there. But we're also going to celebrate uh, these home groups. And, and here's some testimonials of how much these home groups have met and brought growth to each one of you as we have studied this subject of the Word of God. But one of the main verses was Psalms 119, verses 89 and 90. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth, and it endures. The laws of the Lord endure forever. They do not change. It's very important for me as your pastor to help bring us all to the focus of this idea that change in some areas is a no-no. When Charles and I were first married, we were raising our little kids. We uh, had other relatives that were having babies and uh, they were teaching their kids. And one of the ladies, and I won't mention her name because it's been recorded and she watches these videos, so I won't say her name. She knows who she is. But her favorite term was when the child, the two-year-old, three-year-old was reaching for something was always, no, no. That's a no, no. I said, that's a no, no. And about the hundredth time, I said, do something about it. Other than just saying always, that's a no-no, that's a no-no, that's a no-no. And that poor kid heard it over and over again. But now, here I am preaching on the fact, change is a no-no. <laughs> so I come to the conclusion in my life, there are certain things that you cannot change. And it's a no-no to try to change it. And it's important, so when I share with you, you're going to hear some things in regards to this whole subject, that how it affects your belief basis, your foundation, what the decisions that you make, the way that you believe uh, the Lord is directing your life and how you're being inspired or taught or how the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. All that depends on whether or not you are trying to change what God has already said so it fits your agenda and your desire rather than living according to what his word has already dictated. Change is a no-no. Several areas I'm going to share with, but in Luke chapter 24 is the first one, and it ties on the last 
Sunday sermon, actually, where we were coming to an understanding about certain things in our belief system. But here's a no-no that it goes along with the songs that were sung today and even Russ's song and the ministry of that song as well. When Jesus is talking to his disciples and he has appeared to them now after the resurrection and in Luke chapter 24, if you'll go to verse 44, there's several good verses, but I just want to jump there because it's important that we uh, continue uh, somewhat with a tempo of speed here, not to keep you all morning. But here's the message. He says this in verse 44 of Luke. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Otherwise, the message Jesus is saying hasn't changed. Randy Woods paraphrased Princess's statement. Jesus is saying, I've already told you this, but it hasn't changed. He told them this before the resurrection, and now he has to remind them after the resurrection that what I said before is still the same today. For Jesus, basically, as we know in the book of Hebrews, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is saying to them, look at this verse, verse 44, this is what I told you while I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. I'm reading the NIV, it could be a little different from some of your translations. <laughs> then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. Here it is. He's repeating to them the specific message concerning that the message of salvation through Jesus Christ is not changing ever. Amen. There's only one name by which you can be saved. It is the name of Jesus. And Jesus is underlining and emphasizing to his followers, his disciples, who have witnessed his resurrection. You would think they wouldn't need any kind of a statement of authenticity from the Lord himself. They just witness a resurrection. But still after the resurrection, he has to emphasize to them what the message is that will not change forever. And that message is, this is written, the Christ will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The message, the underlining message that he is wanting us to see and hear is that salvation, the message of Jesus Christ, the Savior of your soul, the one who paid the price on Calvary, the one whose blood has washed away all your sins, that message is good for all eternity. It will not change. As we know, there are many that have tried to change that message. You that have been doing the studies, you know that there are all kinds of what we refer to as cults that have tried to make the message of salvation a different message. There are other major denominational churches that have diluted or changed the message. There's even some translations of scripture that have taken the word blood out, that the blood of Jesus is not really the atoning power of God concerning what's taking place in a person's life when salvation comes. And you and I need to understand that the firmness of our testimony, the firmness of what we believe, that who has saved me. Some of you raised your hands for salvation this morning. Many of you throughout your life, you've somewhere made a determination that you want to serve Jesus Christ and you've received him into your life. That message is true, and the blood of Jesus applies now as well as it did then, and it will tomorrow if you wait to get saved then. 
Another thing that took place when they had this understanding and that the change was not going to take place, there had to be a transformation mentally for them as well as spiritually. I think a lot of times we misplace that, but we forget that we're holistic. We're body, soul, and spirit. Our soul has to do with the mind part of us. And God is wanting through the message of Jesus, this prophetic word concerning who he is and understanding salvation through him, that you need to have your eyes opened to that experience, that it becomes a spiritual experience that responds to your mind. It's not a mental experience that responds to your spirit. It hits your spirit. And when your spirit is changed, that's called being born again, it affects your mind, and your mind then affects your body or your things that you do, how you act out your experience with the Lord. Jesus, in John chapter 3, verse 3, tells Nicodemus, <laughs> You must be born again. Nicodemus says, how in the world can I be born again? I'm a smart guy. And I don't know how I can go back to my mother's womb and make all this happen. You talk about being born again. And Jesus reminds him, it's a spiritual, if you look at John chapter 3, it's a spiritual experience that's taking place in his life. That is going to affect him mentally more than physically. The physical will eventually come by his actions, by the fruit of his life, by what he, how he demonstrates that he has been changed from the inside out, not the outside in. Being born again is you being changed from the inside and it working its way out to the world all around you. That's what God wants us to understand, this whole process and it doesn't change. There are religions that want to teach you that it's a mental decision. Power of positive thinking. You have to be very careful today. There are a lot of shrewd teachings that are affecting and emphasizing more of a mental attitude than a spiritual attitude. A mental decision and a mental process rather than a spiritual process. That's why Jesus said, if you want to come to me, you've got to come as little children. You've got to come simply to Jesus as a small child. And the simplicity of that relationship with him is what makes all the difference. So that we can then, once we come to him, he starts teaching our spirit. That's why you hear this pastor in this church emphasize so much the need for each one of us to spend time bathing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Spirit. God says He is the Spirit. And those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So you and I have a process to understand it's important that wherever you get in life, Wherever you can position yourself in life to where your spirit can be fed. I know people have spent thousands of dollars to go to different seminars and different types of events that there they can hear these, their mind being told what's positive and what's good for them and all these kinds of things, but they miss out on what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in that individual's life. And you and I need a transformation from the inside, we need God telling us by the power of the Holy Spirit, for he is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 There are some places that we try to change oftentimes in scripture that we want to change and it's a no-no. I want to turn all the way to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. Anybody know what's there? Exodus chapter 20. Anybody know what's there? Ten the Ten Commandments. Thank you. The Ten Commandments are listed in 
the world today, in the world that we are living in, and this is where a change is a no-no, is trying to change the Ten Commandments. In fact, they're trying to dilute the Ten Commandments. At one time, most of us, at some age, we lived uh, at a time to where in our classroom, the Ten Commandments usually hung on a wall somewhere. When we went to a courthouse, the Ten Commandments hung in the courthouse. Other places of government, the Ten Commandments, including in Washington, D.C., the Ten Commandments would hang. Because they were the grounding foundational principles that God wanted his people to live by. And God never changed his mind, church. Diluting or changing the Ten Commandments is a no-no. Tell your politicians to fight back to get the Ten Commandments back in our classroom. Hello, church. Because they are principles that we have to understand that are basic to everything else that we do. And if you start changing or diluting or taking these out of your life, then what do you have as a guideline or a measuring stick for you to measure your life against? How can the Holy Spirit convict you if you don't know what's wrong? And the Holy Spirit is there to convict us. The Holy Spirit is there. That spirit man that I was talking about is present with us so that when we do something that we shouldn't, we know uh, it's called conviction or a sense of feeling like, I shouldn't be doing this. It's like... Uh, don't tell Charcy she's over here. She stole the candy bar. Charcy. Five cents. The candy bars were five cents then, right? She got a candy bar. Thank you, honey, for letting me use you for an illustration of thievery. I want you to know she stole the candy bar, but she told me well, she did that when she was a small child. But she never enjoyed one by them. Yeah. She never enjoyed one by them. Why? Because of the guilt, the sense that I need to go back and pay for that, and finally confess to her parents what she did so they could make it right. And you feel the same way. I heard a speaker once, one of my favorite motivational speakers, a guy named Charlie Tremendous Jones. Charlie Tremendous Jones was his name. That was his legal name. But he would tell a story about his teenagers going out on their dates. And he said the worry that a lot of parents have, of course, what happens in the back seat of a car. He said, my kids may have gotten the back seat of the car, but they never enjoyed it. <laughs> because he told them it was sin. See the simple message? You start trying to change the Ten Commandments. You start losing everything in regards to those principles that keep you honest and true to that which God has birthed within you. Because once you're saved, Jesus Christ lives within you. The Holy Spirit becomes alive in you. He will tell you that's a no-no. Stop it. When you start to pick up that drink, you know, some of you in this audience, you've had to deal with alcoholism. And once you've gone through a spiritual experience and you've gone through some ministry that the Holy Spirit's done in your life, you go to pick up that glass or that bottle and you know, you know it's wrong. And I pray you never lose the fact that it's wrong. Or you that do other things. I mentioned pornography earlier. For some reason, that's on my mind. Some of you men, uh, the statistics would tell me that five out of the men that are present in this church service today, statistically telling us that five out of 50 of you will have an addiction to pornography. You're online. It's a tragedy. It robs you of so many things. But when you start 
looking at the screen or fantasizing about whatever it might be that you're looking at. I know this is real preaching this morning, okay? But I want you to know, I'm praying that God somehow will speak to you that when you turn that channel on, you got to say, no, I won't do that. Because it's a way of committing fornication or adultery as far as the Bible is concerned. It's a sexual sin. God's word is true. And he's calling me on somebody's phone right now and let me know. <laughs> so he says in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, there we go. No other gods before me. Bonnie's going to get that. Just you know, that's, that's fine. You shall make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth, beneath. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Let me pause there for a moment as we just read on read from the NIV again. Look how many generations are affected by you changing what God said not to do. Think about that. I, I was talking to somebody the other day and I, that has some issues and they wanted some counseling and, and uh, they don't belong to this church, but I was being a friend to them and uh, sharing some things. And when they were talking to me, I said, do you realize your decision process doesn't just affect you? I mean, you can rationalize why you can get away with this and do that. You can whitewash. You know what? We can rationalize anything for ourselves. But then the reality is, God says, it's going to affect the third and fourth generation. The curse, whatever you want to refer to it. That's why in the spirit, we need to say, Lord, Bring us back to that place of purity and forgive us. And we can come back and take that curse and bind it so it doesn't proceed any further. But we have to come face to face with it and a reality and a myth, the fact that we tried to change what God said not to change so it would fit our lifestyle. God help us not to do that. I'm not going to read all the... Ten Commandments. You can read it for yourself. They're all there listed for you. Some of you may need, need to be concerned about you. It says, uh, you shall not murder. So you can't kill me this morning as you're not in church. Uh, and of course, he goes on, do not commit adultery, do not steal, Charcy. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor, etc. There's another scripture that maybe... Uh, you haven't noticed before, but I think it's important that we look at it. How are we doing? Good. Those comfortable pews, you're, you're here for a while. <laughs> there's a, in the sixth chapter of Proverbs, there's some other things that change as a no no. It relates to somewhat to the Ten Commandments, as we looked at in the book of Exodus. But just so if you're a Bible student and you want to look up these things, maybe you haven't seen it before, but it's underlined in my Bible several times. Literally, I could get the highlighter and all that words alongside of it. Six things God hates. And seven is detestable to him. Six things God hates. How many knew God hates some things? I mean, this is a new verse to you. Just raise your hand if you say, yeah, a couple of you. The rest of you have no excuse. <laughs> Seven are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers. We can't change what God has laid down as foundational rules for interaction 
with one another. The Ten Commandments give us the big scope of the foundation of the principles God wants you to live by and to exercise. But then when he underlines and says through Solomon to us, there's six other things that I literally hate. And yet, for some reason, mankind, he puts it in here because a lot of people want to change this. They don't want to make it so personal or so direct to how they exercise and pour out these things. So it's something we have to be careful of, work on, because these things will kill unity. They'll kill what God wants to have take place within the body of believers, which is for us to get along with one another. I like getting along with you. And I hope you like getting along with me, that we can all do that. And there's a variety of, it shows these physical reactions, different types of uh, the heart, the scheming things that take place. And we've got to be careful that we don't do things that God hates, because he does. One more scripture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, you're familiar with. Because it has to do with the beatitude. See, the Ten Commandments are laws you must live by. And the six things that God hates are things that we should stay away from as we grow in God. And Matthew chapter 5, the beatitudes are what we should be increasing in and getting better. Things that we should do. Things that we should do. How many know it can be very negative if a pastor just stopped in the place saying, Ten Commandments are here. Here's the six things and seven things that God hates. That's a whole lot. But here's what God really wants us to do. And Jesus, again, is teaching this. And it's principles that should not change. And it's called the right attitudes or the beatitudes. There's all kinds of names we give this. And the NIV refers to blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here are the things that God wants us to develop and keep growing in in our lives. Things that we should do in our life. So if you want to know what you can do without changing what God is already said to do. Just do what he asks. Here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is though are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Have you found any of these yet you want to change? No. These are things we don't want to change. He goes on to talk, blessed, in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you, because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now listen to verse 17, and I'll close with this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Ten commandments. The six things that God hates, seven. Jesus is saying, do not think that I have come to abolish the law, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. There's the scripture that it all rests on, that you and I look at, and Jesus is saying, 
this law of God is eternal and it does not change. It does not change. So when we take communion this morning, we're going to do that right now. We come to the acknowledgement of remembering Jesus. This is an ordinance that we do in the church. We are asked by Jesus himself to remember him and to partake of the emblems that are presented. The bread is a type of his body which was broken and bruised for you. The drink represents, it's a grape juice, and it represents the blood of Jesus which has washed away our sins. As we serve this message this morning, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ will never change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And every time we partake of these emblems that you're going to receive this morning, it reminds you that your salvation is firm and everlasting and eternal through Jesus Christ himself. The Bible does tell us, though, before we partake, let a man examine himself. And so we're going to look at ourselves and see if there are some of those changes that we've tried to make that need to be resolved, dealt with. Those changes from God's laws, from that which he desires for us. Help us, Lord, and ask him to forgive us it even goes so far to tell us if you have ought against your brother before you partake, go to your brother and forgive him. If I had room this morning, we could have a foot washing service, which is a way of forgiving one another. So there's all these kinds of things that are happening in the spirit that allows us to be all that God wants us to be as whole believers, being free to serve God. And to recognize Jesus and the price that was paid on Calvary's cross for our salvation. Those that are going to help us, would you please come? We'll ask you to put.